Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Kim Dorman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library. I'm so glad to see you all here this evening on Crowdcast as we do virtual Princeton Public Library. Um, I'm really thrilled uh, to be able to welcome you to this program. When I first read the Stonewall Reader some time ago, um, I just completely fell in love with it. I, I really appreciated everything about it, not only the histories that it was telling, um, uh, learning about people that I didn't know about, sort of uh, meeting people I was aware of in a new way, um, but also just, you know, the fact that this is a book that's a creation of the New York Public Library. Uh, Jason, uh, I never asked you, is it Bauman or Bowman? It's Bauman. Bauman. <laughs> I'm sorry. So Jason Bauman uh, serves as the Susan and Douglas Dillon Assistant Director for um, Collection Development and is coordinator of the Humanities and LGBT Collections at the New York Public Library. Um, and so I thought it was just really interesting that the NYPL was, um, you know, has so much documentation that they've curated this collection and that they've created, or that Jason uh, created this book. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the book. Um, how you uh, collected, how you chose the stories that you chose to share, and uh, what it's like to be continually curating a collection like this. Um, we can't, we can't um, all welcome you, but if we were in the library, I promise you we would all be clapping. Thank you so much, Jason, for coming. Thank you. And so I put together a little PowerPoint, uh, some images to kind of ground the thing uh, to talk to you about uh, libraries collections, uh, the exhibition that we did last year on the history of Stonewall and the book um, that came out of that. So let me share my screen. Let's see if I do this correctly. Be patient with my, okay, I'm gonna share. And from beginning. Here we go. Here we go. So here's the cover Stonewall Reader um, came out uh, last spring in conjunction with um, the show we did Love and Resistance Stonewall at 50 um, that ran from Valentine's Day through mid July at the New York Public Library. Um, so first, I thought I'd tell you something about New York Public Library's LGBT collections, which are really among the greatest in the United States. Um, this is a photo from our collection of Walt Whitman with his uh, then partner, Bill, Bill Duckett. Um, and so New York Public Library's LGBT collections really go back to um, uh, Walt Whitman. And so um, we have one of the greatest collections of Walt Whitman manuscripts and ephemera memorabilia um, in the United States in this collection, the Oscar Lyon collection. <clears throat> and so um, really for history of homosexuality and particularly gay men, it all goes back to Whitman and everybody was deeply interested in Whitman um, and from Oscar Wilde um, and everyone else. Uh, so we amassed this collection of Walt Whitman manuscripts that really became sort of central thing for studying 19th century, turn of the century um, uh, gay men. There really is that history there in uh, Whitman's manuscripts. Um, and then in the 1980s, there was this, uh, this is this poster, Homosexuals Are Different, and this was designed by the Mattachine Society of New York, actually uh, so Mattachine Society was the main uh, gay rights organization in the United States from the 1950s through 60s and continued on through the 1970s. This is about mid-1960s. Uh, Dick Leitch, who was the head of New York City's Mattachine Society, um, found that picture of the, the zebras and the the spotted zebra, maybe a giraffe um, to show homosexuals are different. He's actually, I got to talk to Dick and uh, he saw the picture in an advertising magazine and then ripped it out and put together this poster. Um, so uh, mid, the, in New York City, um, there was this, so you had Manicheen Society in the 1960s that was very active in New York. Then in the 1970s, you had this other organization, Gay Activists Alliance, um, which is kind of part of the story actually of the exhibition. And they had a history and libraries kind of committee that eventually evolved into this organization called the International Gay Information Center that was an independent LGBT archive. <clears throat> and they inherited the papers of the Manicheen Society of New York and Gay Activist Alliance. 
um, but also amassed a huge um, book collection, periodical collection, um, kept ephemera from organizations all around the world. And so in late 80s, that collection had grown to fill several apartments and they could no longer sustain it. And they donated the entire archive to the New York Public Library. And that really became the cornerstone of our um, sort of modern collecting around the history of LGBT uh, issues. And so that collection then uh, uh, attracted many other collections, Barbara Giddings and Kate Tobin Lehusen, um, who were major um, lesbian activists for Doris Politis in the 1960s, 70s, and many other individual activists who gave their papers once, uh, also scholars like Martin Duberman, um, Jonathan Katz. Um, this became this sort of central focus that attracted many other archives to New York Public Library. Then. This is a poster from ACT UP New York, um, then criticizing then Mayor uh, Ed Koch. Uh, but uh, so early, mid 90s, there were a number of AIDS activist organizations sort of came of age, went through many transitions, ACT UP uh, sort of downsized, GMHC moved and was looking for, it went into a new space. And so the library had established this specialty. And as these organizations went through transitions, we took in their archives. So the library has the archives of ACT UP New York, which is a important AIDS activist organization, Gay Men's Health Crisis, which is really pioneering um, AIDS activist and service organization. Um, also People with AIDS Coalition, and then many individual activists um, associated with um, those organizations. Library, we also have a uh, special project at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, which is part of New York Public Library. We have a specialty library in Africana Studies, and they have a specialty they, it's, it was called first the Black Gay and Lesbian Archive, then the In the Life Archive, um, but established really a specialty in documenting LGBT African-American experience and Africana experience. Uh, many of uh, really great collections about around Black gay writers in the 1980s. Eurostato Saint, who was Haitian-American, um, but also Melvin Dixon. Um, uh, Joseph Beam, particularly there was this collective other countries. Um, and we also have that collective's papers also of um, black lesbian writers like Jewel Gomez. Um, and then a history, really history of the blues and cabaret performance, and so, which included from uh, Alberta Hunter uh, to in blues performer to Stormy DeLavier, um, who was a drag king in the 1960s and is also uh, said to have been one of the participants in the Stonewall riots as well. And so we have Stormy's papers. Uh, last but not least, our, we have a library for performing arts that collects um, uh, theater history and dance history as one of the best collections in the country. And they have a specialty in the history of drag performance. So which ranging from on the left, uh, Julian Eltinge, who was the most famous uh, female impersonator of the um, early 20th century. And Julian, that's in him and his best known role, The Fascinating Widow. Um, and uh, Julian had a fashion magazine, had a theater on 42nd Street that featured uh, his performances um, and was kind of like the RuPaul actually of the early 20th century in terms of uh, his fame and reach. And on the right, Charles Pierce, uh, uh, who was a, a kind of character actress. Um, and so, we collect the full range of the history of drag and drag performance, also drag kings, um, and they're particularly relating to downtown New York theater scene. So, and the our current work, so um, we have a partnership. There's this organization, the New York City Trans Oral History Project, and when they were starting out, they were really interested in documenting uh, trans lives in New York City, um, but we're looking for, they wanted to do the interviewing, but they couldn't figure out where would be the repository and preservation plan for these interviews. And so we formed a partnership with them. I think it's almost 200 interviews now. It's the largest archive of its kind. Um, and uh, 
interviewing all kinds of people, current activists, historic activists, um, regular people, famous scholars, um, a whole range of um, voices. And the interviews are all have transcriptions and are preserved in our uh, digital collections long term. So uh, I also have to, I always have to mention because I license e-resources, but also so we, uh, invest in a huge amount of uh, e-resource content and so the scale primary resources archives of sexuality and gender um there's a database actually we contributed to and so um the full archives of attic machine society of new york and also of act up um, were digitized and made part of this database and it includes um, lgbt archives from places all around the country um, and so this is available from new york public library and it's part of a partnership that we've been in to try and make this material more available so about now 11 years ago i started working on these issues at new york public library um, we had huge backlogs at nypl and so we've raised about three million dollars um, to preserve and process all of these material and do programming um, to promote it um, and so we've gone gotten all of our backlogs available to the public um, and we've digitized all of the audio video materials that we have. We have a fellowship that we've established and we've digitized lots and lots of the photos in this collection. Probably, um, pro there may be about 6,000 at this point um, LGBT historical images that are available through the our website. We've done four exhibitions and then two books. Um, so last year for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, um, we did the show Love and Resistance. Um, and the really the point of the show was really to show how Stonewall's a turning point. Um, a lot of times people think of Stonewall as the beginning of LGBT political movements, and really they're throughout the and it, and people and we'll, I'll show you a little bit more later. Think of it as like this first riot or the first time that LGBT people fought back, which really isn't true. And so there's a long history of LGBT political activism in the United States. Um, particularly from the 1950s on. Um, and really there's a series of uh, riots across the 1960s and growing political activism in the 1960s. And Stonewall is really this moment where it become, reaches a kind of critical mass. And in the 1960s, you have small groups of very pioneering activists doing this work. Uh, but in 19, with Stonewall, it really becomes a mass movement. So, um, and you can see here, this is one of the images, the, two of the images that were in the show. On the left is the Stonewall Bar, actually right in, this is either July, late August. And so there's a photo by uh, Diana Davies um, of the exterior of the Stonewall after the riots. And on the right is a uh, flyer. This was produced by the Managing Society of New York. Um, trying to pull people to get involved in political activism. So you have this whole um, uh, group of people who are radicalized by participating in Stonewall, hearing about Stonewall, and groups like Madison try to draw them in to this political movement. Um, there's one thing that I think that people argue about a lot with Stonewall is, was it a riot? Was it an uprising? Is it a rebellion? Um, and there are lots of reasons to use both of those words. I think it, it, like having this flyer here that says, it's notable, it calls it the Christopher Street riots, right? And so it associates it with um, the people out on the street, which, you'll, which you read a lot about actually in the anthology and people's memories of what happened. So the Stonewall is a illegal bar, right? Um, and something you don't really understand about Stonewall or even about gay politics in the 1960s is that in New York City a bar could be could it was could be shut down if they had known gay patrons. So um, and the under the grounds that uh, homosexuality in these bars constituted uh, disorderly conduct. Um, it's important to realize also part of this is that homosexuality was illegal in most states in the United States, including New York. Um, and you could serve three year, three months in prison um, for homosexuality in New York in the 1960s um, and up to life in prison in other states. 
um, homosexuality was also considered a mental illness and you could be institutionalized by your family if they didn't uh, agree with your life life choices. They could have you put in an asylum and subjected to electroshock treatments and all kinds of tortures. So um, this is part of why there's these bars and gathering places for um, gay men, lesbians, transgender people in the 1960s, they're often run by organized crime because they were establishments that really catered to people who were criminals, right? There's always the thing, challenge I have working with students is to get them to realize, oh, being gay meant you were a criminal at this time. So um, because those bars were like the Stonewall controlled by the mafia, um, the patrons didn't really associate the Stonewall bar with the revolution, right? They really thought of the, it was the Christopher Street riot for the people at the time and not the Stonewall riot. Also, so this word riot, it, 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 the late 1960s were a time strangely like our own um, with a great deal of unrest uh, and protests against uh, racial injustice. And so there was uh, riots all across the United States in, uh, in Watts, in Detroit, in New York, in many other cities. Um, and so the activists who experienced that uh, conflict with the police at Stonewall um, wanted to link the things that happened there with this larger civil rights uh, movement that was happening in the United States. So the, I think that they're using the term riot to talk about their experience. It was an effort to link the events at Stonewall with these uprisings against racial injustice that were happening in the United States in the 1960s. And it's something also that I showed in the exhibition, but also showed in the book is, it, really there wouldn't have been an LGBT civil rights movement if it hadn't been for the African-American civil rights movement. And that that the influence, the changes in that African-American civil rights movement directly impacted the tone and approaches that were used by gay and lesbian and transgender activists. So um, also just to note, you'll see a bunch of things in, in the slideshow, um, two of the great treasures of uh, New York Public Library's LGBT collections are the photographs of Kay Tobin Lahusen and Diana Davies. And so Kay was a activist in Daughters of Letus from early 60s um, and is still alive today and kicking and um, doing her best um, to help the cause now. Um, and she, she was really the first um, professional LGBT photojournalist, really documenting um, LGBT politics for LGBT communities. Um, and in the early 1970s, she wrote this book, The Gay Crusaders, um, which she's uh, posing with a, a blow up of the cover. And for that book, she went around the country interviewing everybody that she thought was an important uh, gay activist at the time. And so that was one of the sources for the book is I got to draw on her interviews because the library, we have Kay and her partner, Barbara Ginning's papers. Um, so we had all of the source interviews that went into putting together the Gay Crusaders. And we also have her photo archive, which was a resource for doing the physical exhibition. Um, Diana Davies is a really amazing photojournalist, was a photojournalist, a professional photojournalist in general before coming to uh, LGBT political movements in 1960s. She's really um, documenting anti-war movement, uh, student movement, uh, black power, um, and then gets involved in the gay liberation front right after Stonewall. Um, and then really does an amazing job of documenting the early years of the gay liberation movement and some of the most iconic photographs of uh, activists like Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, and many others um, are taken by Diana Davies. And we have an archive of about uh, almost 4,000 photos by Davies um, that we've digitized. She also did a great amount of photography of um, uh, feminist movement and activism, um, and also of uh, blues and jazz music scenes, and was a foreign correspondent and all kinds of things. But we have her gay liberation uh, photography, but her other photographs are in many other, um, including archives, including Smithsonian um, and other universities. So the, the show tried to, sh to demonstrate 
this turning point of Stonewall. And so on the left, if this picture, one of the first themes is activism and demonstrations. And so on the left, you see, this is one of the first public demonstrations for uh, LGBT rights in the United States. This is uh, a protest at the Pentagon in 1965. Um, and you can see sort of the tone of this is held by Managing Society and Daughters of Bledis on the East Coast. Um, Lily Vincenz, who's the woman smiling, and you see her in lots of the pictures. She was part of Washington's uh, Daughter of Bledis uh, chapter. Um, but this, and this is by Kay Tobin Lahusen. And you see the picture. You Kay was a great is a great photographer because you can really frame an event to see that this is something important that's happening, but also this is everybody who is willing to demonstrate in front of the Pentagon, all maybe twenty of them who were willing to be in a demonstration in 1965 demanding uh, LGBT rights. It's also not notable and for the win that happened in the past that happened last week. Um, these early demonstrations in the 1960s were all about employment rights and the right to federal employment. Um, and because this is a major way that uh, gays and lesbians, transgender people were discriminated against. So um, the demonstration of the Pentagon um, was to precisely for these rights that it took another 50 years, over 50 years um, for us to win. Um, on the right, this is the, the gay being happening that happened in Central Park. This is uh, also, this one's by Diana Davies. Um, and so the first Pride March is held um, the year after Stonewall. <clears throat> it's obviously, as you see from the Kay Lewison picture, it's not the first march of any kind, but it's this first Pride March commemorating the, the one year anniversary of the Stonewall riots. Um, and you now see the thousands of people who are willing to publicly demonstrate, right? So this is a few, this is six years, five, five years later, um, now thousands of people willing to come out of the closet and demonstrate publicly. So you can see how Stonewall was this turning point in activism. Um, next, uh, the library has amazing collection of periodicals, which also uh, feed into the book. Um, the ladder on the left is the ladder from the 1960s early, um, and covers the ladder almost always had people either in silhouette or people pictured from behind to protect the uh, identities of the people pictured in, and featured in the magazine. And on the right, this is after uh, Stonewall, this magazine, Lesbian Tide, that was edited by Jean Cordova, um, who's also, uh, there's a part of her memoir is in the book, um, but this was a demonstration, the New York Staff Asura, and so this was a march by lesbian activists on the um, New York Museum of Natural History um, to protest the heterosexism and uh, uh, sexism of the Museum of Natural History. They have the Hall of Man, right? And there are no gay people pictured in, or gay anything pictured in the Museum of Natural History, which purports to uh, demonstrate everything about human life and biology. Um, and so they brought this gigantic pink dinosaur that they marched onto the Museum of Natural History. So it, this radically different uh, aesthetic. Um, other theme was nightlife. So Manchin, um, held, uh, one of the things in the 1960s, held dances um, because of these bars that were controlled by the mafia. Um, you could be arrested, you could be blackmailed for going to these bars. Um, and so they held alternative parties um, as places for gay men, lesbians, transgender people to congregate. So many of these activist organizations did that. And then that's grandly expanded Post Stonewall, on the right, there's a picture by Diana Davies of the firehouse. And so the Gay Activist Alliance had a community center and a firehouse in the early 70s, um, which they also did uh, parties in um, that became fundraisers, but were also like the great nightlife place to be in New York in the 1970s. And lastly, for the themes for the show, um, were depictions of love, which I realized were incredibly important both to Kayla Husen and to Diana Davies. Um, on the left, this is a picture from the latter um, that was in Kayla Husen's archive. And so there are many, many pictures like this in Kay's archive of these pictures of couples, um, always depicted from behind to protect their identities. 
um, sort of trying, struggling to depict intimacy while protecting people's identities. And then on the right, this is a picture that Kay did in the uh, mid 70s. It's actually at the first um, Integrity Conference, which is a conference for, uh, which is an organization for LGBT uh, Episcopalians. Um, and she captured this very beautiful picture of this couple uh, kissing at the conference. So you can see this uh, huge change in, in gay and lesbian uh, depictions of love and intimacy before and after Stonewall. Um, one of the goals, both for the show and also for the book, was also to show uh, contributions and presence of people of color um, during this time. And so uh, the man on the left in the gay revolution, so the, it's also part of, there was this organization, Third World Gay Revolution, that came out of Gay Activist Alliance and uh, the Gay Liberation Front, which are these uh, key organizations that grew up after came up after Stonewall. And so there were many people of color who were involved in those organizations who felt that they didn't adequately, adequately address their experience as people of color. Also because so much of the gay act, and particularly the Gay Liberation Front was inspired by organizations like the Young Lords and the Black Panthers. And they felt that Gay Liberation Front was inspired by them, but really didn't go far enough. And so they split off and created their own organization, Third World Gay Revolution. It was really mainly African-American and Latino um, activists who really wanted something that addressed their own needs. Uh, the, on the picture on the right is actually from Rutgers University's um, Gay and Lesbian Conference in the early 1970s, a student conference, um, and it's African American SM, BDSM activists talking about their experiences. So it, the we did this in-person exhibition, and then we were luckily approached by Penguin, um, who wanted to do a reader. And so we really framed this as a companion piece for the show um, to explore many of these same issues, but having drawing on the many texts that we have in the library's collections. So uh, drawing on the work we're doing now with the New York City Trans Oral History Project. And so there's several people who were interviewed for that project who actually were at the Stonewall, Stonewall Uprising. Um, also Kay Luhusen's archive of interviews with LGBT activists in the 1970s, and also um, historian Eric Marcus, who's done this amazing book, Making Gay History, and also uh, Making Gay History podcast. And so we have the archive of all of his interviews and their transcriptions. So we were able to draw on these original source stories and then also the LGBT book archive that we had from have from the International Gay Information Center, periodical archive, and really the larger um, printed and published archives that we have in New York Public Library to put together this anthology. <clears throat> and so the anthology split into three sections of before Stonewall, during Stonewall, and after Stonewall. And so the section on before Stonewall is to give people a sense of what life felt like during that period in late 50s uh, in the 1960s to be gay, lesbian, transgender um, in the United States and focusing on New York City. I made the focus New York, um, but it's not limited to New York. Um, then the section on during Stonewall is firsthand accounts of people's experiences of participating in the Stonewall riots. And then the last section after Stonewall is to give a sense of the kind of activism and this new kind of spirit of resistance that emerged um, in the wake of Stonewall. So I'll walk you through the different kinds of people that are, that are in there. I can't go through all 30, but just to give you a sense of the kinds of stories that are in there. So we open with Audrey Lord, um, excerpt from her memoir, Zami, um, and this beautiful piece about her uh, moving to the village and her experiences in the late 50s as African-American lesbian, feeling like she's the only African-American lesbian, uh, making connections with one other uh, African-American lesbian, how she interacts with white lesbian community, um, and really her coming of age and how she came to understand herself as a gay person. Um, then in, it's nice in comparison, Ernestine Eckstein, um, who's African-American woman in the sunglasses on the left. Um, and so there's an interview with her that Kay Lehusen did. And 
Ernestine's really one of the, I think, unsung heroes of that whole time because she had she was a member of Daughters of Belitis, was sort of vice president of Daughters of Belitis in New York City um, in 1960s. Um, and she had come from the African-American student movement and, and uh, civil rights movement. And she really was one of the people pushing for these kinds of demonstrations. Uh, if it hadn't been for her, all of these demonstrations may not have happened because she was really one of the people um, insisting that this was the next step to do these kinds of uh, open and political demonstrations. And she's one of those concrete links between the African-American and uh, LGBT civil rights movements. So there's a great interview with her and her feelings about those two movements and their interrelationship. Um, uh, then this great magazine, uh, Transvestia, uh, that was edited uh, by Virginia Prince. And this is an issue. And so Virginia Prince, uh, uh, transgender, a uh, woman, uh, and she edited this magazine uh, 1960s, and I think it goes through the 1970s. And so, it, something important in the mag in at this time, and also in the book, is that people's um, understandings of themselves have changed over time, and even transgender people's understanding of what it meant to be transgender has changed in many ways. And so transvestia was mostly men at the time who thought of themselves, people who thought of themselves as men who were transvestites. Um, and so writing in about their experiences, many of them were in heterosexual marriages, so whether they told their wives about their lives, about their relationships with their uh, with their partners, with their families. Uh, many of these are people who today might think of themselves as transgender, but in the 1960s thought of themselves in a very different way. Um, and it's, it, so I include in her, in the book, her story about, that's how she became Virginia Prince. Um, and her personal coming out, um, she's in a failed, in a, she's in a marriage, really that her uh, wife leaves her when she discovers her secret life as a transvestite and um, really how they, she then finds another woman who understands her and is willing to um, be with her and accept her for who she is. And uh, Prince is really important, I think, and it is really supposed to be one of the people who coins this word transgender. Um, but it, I think there's some controversy about her as a figure, um, her own opinions and her own uh, uh, self-understanding and process of how she came to this, um, but really important to have these firsthand stories of how did people experience themselves? How did they experience gender? How did they experience um, really the suppression that they faced in society? Similarly, Mario Martino, so Mario Martino, uh, transsexual, uh, female to male transsexual, uh, 1960s and actually starts in late 60s, this organization Labyrinth Counseling um, and uh, was really kind of a self-help organization um, for transgender people to deal with um, legal issues. Mart so the piece by Mart Martino wrote this great book, um, Emergence, um, and autobiography. And so there's amazing passage in there talking about his experiences with changing his name and getting all of his paperwork done and really exploitation he, f he faced with uh, lawyers and the legal system. So I thought it was really important. I think so, so much, I think people think that uh, transgender political issues are a recent phenomena, right? And they really aren't, right? And they're going back to the 1950s and 60s in the United States, that there really is a movement there and people organizing. Uh, a lot of that um, is these kinds of self-help organizations. You also had Reed Erickson um, and others. Um, and but Mario Martino, it's beautiful uh, memoir and I'm um, really getting his sense of what it meant to transition and the legal uh, problems that he faced during that process. Um, then great, uh, here's Barbara Giddings, who was Kayla Husson's partner. Um, he, this is one of the marches in the 1960s at Independence Hall. So in the 1960s, every July 4th, there was a protest by Manichin and Jordan Sabalitas at Independence Hall that were called these reminder marches to remind the country that LGBT people weren't, still didn't have full equality. Um, and so this picture of Giddings, but an interview with Giddings, she's very, uh, 
with Giddings, I think there's always this kind of, um, how to say, there's this kind of split between how she was perceived privately and may have talked privately and her career as an activist, right? And actually in the interview that she did for Gay Crusaders with her partner, Kay Lewson, she's, it's a very intimate interview and she actually talks about her first times going to gay bars and actually that, um, in outside of Philadelphia and she would actually cross dress um, to dress up as a boy to go to these bars when she was younger and her experiences with gay bashing and uh, seeing people assaulted and her own gender identity um, at, during that time. So it's a, it's a really lovely interview and she's just very, very intimate and open, you know, about her experience in a way that I don't think she was in other writings. And Craig Rodwell, um, one of the key activists who um, organized the first Pride March after Stonewall was one of the key people pushing for that. A note here in Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookstore. So this interview with Craig, with Craig um, about why, and it, it's interesting people think about all these things happening after Stonewall, but actually uh, he opened Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookstore before Stonewall and was really part of that pioneering activist uh, scene of the 1960s. So he really tried to create a bookstore that had uh, good books by and about gays and lesbians um, that weren't pornographic, for him not, weren't pornographic, but were really about people's lives and ref reflected people's lives. So then narratives during Stonewall. So the, one of the most important things, um, I have one uh, friend, uh, we have her papers at the library, but she always says that she's the only person who wasn't at Stonewall. And so everybody says they were at the Stone uh, at the Stonewall that night. And I really tried not to police or censor people's accounts. I really, uh, there are many books that have tried to get at what, like, what the truth of what happened that night. And it, particularly David Carter's book, um, David who recently passed away, but he really did an amazing job of trying to compare all of the testimony that we have about what happened at Stonewall and really to suss out what's true and not true. And um, I actually took an opposite strategy and I wanted to show how much disagreement there is. Um, for David Carter, he really sort of had this rule, I think that unless three people said the same thing, he didn't accept it as being true. And as I looked more and more at people's narratives at that time, I think there are a few written accounts, particularly the newspaper accounts, um, that influence the way people remember what happened. And so uh, more and more, I started to question whether the, does the number of people saying a thing make it more true? Uh, or could it be that the person, the one person who's the only person who says a certain thing or noticed a certain moment or action, that might be their unique perspective. They might have been in the tumult of these hundreds of people uh, uh, fighting back against the police. Maybe that one person is the only person who saw a certain thing. So I, I it really started to call into question What's, historic, what's a historical record? What's a valid historical record? And how are we influenced by what we read and what we remember? You know, it, it, I was an activist with ACT UP New York, and there are many uh, demonstrations that I were part of that I don't remember everything that happened. And I'm sure that other people remember them differently, maybe because they were on the other side of the crowd. If there are a few hundred people or a thousand people, do the people on each side remember the same things? So I really preferred to have as many voices as possible um, and to let all of those contradictions uh, be contradictions. So it starts off with, um, here's Dick Leitch with Barbara Giddings and Leitch ran Mattachine Society of New York. Um, this is a piece he wrote right after the riots. It's called The Hairpin Drop Heard Around the World. Um, and he's really the person who's responsible for saying that Stonewall was the first riot in history. It starts out the first gay riots in history took place in the pre-dawn hours of uh, June 28th, um, even though Leitch knew these weren't the first riots because he was part of the gay press in the 1960s, so he knew this was a myth that he was creating. Um, and a lot of the myths that we have about Stonewall come out of this. Um, particularly about Judy Garland and the full moon and all these things, they really come out of uh, Dick Leitch's piece. Um, other, we have an interview with Marsha P. Johnson. Um, 
and actually together um, with Randy Wicker, who's on the right, who was a, Randy was a key person managing and gay activist uh, in New York in the 1960s. Um, first gay, out gay person to be on television, interviewed as a gay, as a gay man. Um, and they were actually, people don't, I think, realize often that they were very, very close. And actually, uh, Marsha lived with uh, Randy for great, for many years. And so we interviewed them together. It's interesting, um, Marsha is much more radical and Randy talks about how he wasn't ready for Stonewall and he was actually against all the activism that happened in the 1970s. He thought it was gonna make everybody look bad. He was part of this kind of politics of respected gay respectability um, that you had in the 1960s. Uh, with Sylvia Rivera, um, who talks about her experience uh, as a part of this activism and being shut out of this activism. And I think really the kind of prejudice that she faced um, as a trans activist in the gay and lesbian activism of the 1970s, also about with Marcia, she had this organization, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, um, that really was kind of a self-help organization for transgender people, gender non-conforming people in the early 70s in New York, um, and also the, the challenges that they faced. I also included Holly Woodwell on. I tried to look for people that may not, people may not have realized were in Stonewall and Hollywood Woodwell was um, star Andy Warhol factory scene, but really also is also Puerto Rican, uh, uh, Puerto Rican is actress, writer, uh, performer, and she re it really is amazing and talking about uh, really um, Latino, Latina, uh, queer people and transgender people who were living in the village at the time. And so there really was this whole scene in the village of Latinx people um, who were also activists who were involved in Stonewall. And it's really beautifully and dramatically um, illustrated in Hollywood Villan's memoir. And Morty Manford, uh, Morty Manford's mother started PFLAG and also Morty Manford's uh, experience of the riots. Here I'm getting. Get into time. So, so after Stonewall, you can see this is a, a seemingly ragtag group of young people um, who were activists, Gay Liberation Front, marching on Times Square, actually in riots that happened in um, the summer after the first Pride March. And so that's something that's not really remembered in history. It's actually there was a great deal of rioting, gay rioting in New York um, the summer after the first, in summer 1970. Um, and so this is after the riots. Um, very, and so you see a very different group of people than in those 1960s demonstrations, much, much younger, uh, many more of them people of color, really coming from a whole kind of counterculture that you didn't have in the 1960s. And so I'm trying to capture in this section after Stonewall these kinds of voices. So including Jean Cordova. So Jean uh, edited uh, Mexican American, um, lesbian activist on the West Coast. She helped organize the first Pride March in Los Angeles, uh, which happened the first year, the same year as the Pride March here. Um, and she also ran the Lesbian Tide. So it's about her political experience of political organizing in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Um, Joel Hall. And so Joel, <clears throat> um, this amazing piece, Growing Up Black and Gay. And so Joel was part of the Third World Gay Revolution movement um, and also was incarcerated as a young adult for many years because of his homosexuality. So he talks about both his experience of incarceration, the oppression he faced as a black gay man, and really how his coming to political consciousness really saved him. He wrote a few of these. Uh, he was really, I think, forgotten. Nobody had really looked into his work for since the 1970s, but I was able to find his pieces in Gay Sunshine, um, which was this gay newspaper, political newspaper. Uh, um, they're just beautifully written. He eventually became a choreographer as major figure in dance in Chicago, um, and I think was really thrilled to be remembered and included in the anthology. Um, then uh, we have some more from, from Barbara Giddings. Um, and last, uh, is this last? No, yeah, yeah this is the last. I include, um, Dr. H. Anonymous, and so he was a psychiatrist. Um, so part of Barbara Giddings, and in the middle, Frank Kameny, um, 
So it's left to right, Barbara on the left, Frank Hameny, who were really veteran activists of the 1960s, but they actually did some of their most important activism in the 1970s. And so this was in early 70s, the um, American Psychiatric Association um, at that time classified homosexuality as a mental illness. And this was part of the way the justification so that people would be institutionalized and subjected to electroshock um, for being gay at the time. And so they got um, Dr. H. Anonymous hiding his name and his face under a Nixon mask um, that they doctored up and with a doctored up microphone so nobody could recognize his voice to testify about his experiences as a gay psychiatrist and about the injustice of the American Psychiatric Association's classification of homosexuality as a mental illness. So there was really this landmark movement that helped um, change our society because after that, shortly after that, within that year, American Psychiatric Association reversed their uh, decision and took it off of the list of mental illnesses, which is really this landmark um, point. So we have interview with um, him, it was actually the speech that he gave at that uh, conference. So I end the book with a few do uh, pieces of documentation. This is one of my favorite pieces of archives to pull for people when they come to the library. And so this was uh, in the 19, 1964 meeting, East Coast Homophile Organization, which was uh, organizing for gay and lesbian activists uh, many across the country. Um, and at their conference, Manachine put together this uh, list of um, state by state, the legal consequences of sodomy, fornication, adultery, and cohabitation, right? And so you can see, like in New York, you could serve three months, right? But you could, in other states, you could serve 20 years in Nebraska, you could serve possibly life in prison in Nevada, right? And to get across, it, this is one of my favorite things to pull for particularly younger people who I don't, luckily, I think can't imagine. Um, uh, homosexuality being in, illegal and even imagine these kinds of legal consequences. And also you can see that they included fornication and adultery and cohabitation to make this point to, I think, their heterosexual peers that the governmental control of sexuality impacts everybody, that it didn't just affect um, gays and lesbians, but that was actually this issue of national concern that affects everyone, right? And so you can really see the, I think, the eloquence of their whole position. So um, I should just less, in addition to the, to the book, um, which hopefully you'll read and get a copy, but we also still have a guide um, to our collections and to the show and to everything we offered um, that you can, you can access online. Some of them are subscription things for New York Public Library, but many of them may be available from your own library or things that you can get from home. So that is it. And now I will stop sharing. I went on, sorry, I went on a little longer than I thought I would, but there I am. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, um, I, I, I might freeze a little bit because my Wi-Fi isn't that good, so apologies if that happens. Um, I, I saw that the first question that came in was, has NYPL, from Jane Brarian, has NYPL considered doing a traveling version of this exhibit or of the items in your collection that can be borrowed by different libraries across the USA? Do you know, we did a um, panel version um, and uh, yeah, so we've done, for all of the shows we we do, uh, like for a tra traveling exhibition, you have to get other institutions that are willing to pay the money to make the traveling exhibition happen. But for since the library, we have 90 sites. So the exhibition happened in our main, we call our main branch, but the Stephen Schwartzman building at 42nd Street. Um, but we did it, the panel. It, it's kind of an exhibition in a box that you can just sort of unfold and stick. It's condensed, selected images, selected text. Um, and it traveled around the library um, and can be loaned to other libraries and institutions if they're interested. So, um, and we uh, we had also done a show about uh, AIDS activism, why we fight, um, that also has a panel version of it. Um, it's, I, it's a, I think, an interesting opportunity with the, a big library system. You have these 90 locations. So how to get the content both in the main branch, but then across in the boroughs and Staten Island in the boroughs. 
Um, I just want also everybody to know if you have a question, you can ask it down there. I feel like a social media star down at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, people are saying, uh, can we? Can it be loaned if we pay from the same person? Um, it's available for free to institutions, but in the past we haven't charged for it. But for it, we ask the institution to pay shipping. So. Um, right now, it might be complicated because we're the New York Public Library branches are still closed to the public, and actually, most of the staff were not in. But in the fall, we're starting to get back in the building in July, and so once we're back, have enough staff bucket up and running, I'd totally be interested, willing to. So, if anybody, not to give your contact, people who can find me through New York Public Library, it's Jason Bauman at nypl.org, and I can connect you with our exhibitions program. I, I can, I can, I'm not sure he's very good at getting back to people. I try. Uh, a question from Sherry is how and when were state anti-gay laws changed? You know, it's really, it's complicated. So, um, because you have, it, throughout the 19th, like one of the first things for, how to say, so you have this activism in the 1960s and a lot of the activism in the 60s, it was informal laws. Like the, the law, uh, there were laws uh, that were used to close down bars that catered to gay men, lesbians, transgender people, but it was really under this, uh, disorderly conduct. So it wasn't really a law against serving liquor to gay people. It was interpretations of laws, right? So that was the first piece. And it was similar in New York City. Actually, transgender people could be arrested for not wearing clothing that conformed to the legal gender. And they used laws against masquerading, actually, to do that. Um, and then all across, so in the 1970s, as you, you had in New York, a Liberation Front Gay Activist Alliance and similar kind of organizations grow up all across the country and really spread. And you have uh, various efforts to get local uh, anti-discrimination laws passed, really. And so that goes across the night activism in the 1970s and 80s. I forget uh, I forget the year it passed in, in New York. Um, but so you had all of these efforts across the country in various locales to get anti-discrimination laws passed. Um, but then a lot of the things that we've gained have been through the courts and actually haven't been through legislation through like Lawrence versus Texas, which is I always shocks me is I always forget it's 2003, like Lawrence versus Texas is this decision, this uh, decision that that shuts down all uh, sodomy laws. Right. And although they may have been taken off the books or stopped being. Uh, prosecuted in, ver in various places because all of these sodomy laws are local law, they're state laws, right? Um, it wasn't until Lawrence versus Texas that they are as such uh, uh, taken off, no longer valid, right? Um, and so similarly with the employment discrimination case last week, I mean, so there are various kinds of discrimination laws were passed in all very in different locales by uh, year by year, um, but to have at a national level that decision that that dis that is discrimination and illegal is it, it like it, I'm also trying to get to people to realize this arc goes back really like the the marriage equality like when you look at gay magazines in the 1950s and 60s marriage gay marriage in like it's one, which was one of the major gay magazines in the 1950s. And they gay marriage was a gay man married to a woman to hide the fact that he was homosexual. That's what they meant by a gay marriage, right? Wow. <laughs> so it, that takes a long arc, right? And so it, that, it, that's also getting people to realize it's like, and there's a problem that like, there's all these, it, it had to say, it's like law is, um, was well, complicated because all these decisions happen at various kinds of levels of city laws, yeah. of state laws, of federal laws that keep needing to be changed, right? And it's kind of a web, your rights are a web of decisions, right? right. And the, at the same time, and that's the web of decisions can erode. It, I, I always forget that, that Julian Elton, who was that trans, uh, that uh, drag performer early 20th century, because, uh, it, yeah, I should say this, is just to remember, like early 20th century was much more open than the 19, 1940s and 50s, where the society really becomes much more conservative mid 20th century. And so when Julian, Julian Eltinge late in his career um, 
couldn't perform in drag and would actually perform with a mannequin next to him wearing the dress that he would have worn because by late uh, by the 40s 50s the society had gotten much more conservative and he couldn't actually cross-dress anymore in his performances so it, it's to realize it, it's important both there's a long arc to making these things to our legal rights and they actually the legal fate of gays and lesbians and transgender people has not been a steady story of progress, but has actually had great ups and downs throughout history. And so it's incredibly important for gays and lesbians to be politically and transgender people to be politically active because this web of rights that we, what web of rights we currently enjoy can be very quickly eroded. Yeah, I'm very curious about the fact that things went backwards, um, but I want to ask, um, you know, from there, that it was things were freer in the 20s and the more permissive society in the early 20th century. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? Not me. I didn't know. <laughs> uh, so we have Nick asked Nick D. Mizio, uh, who's actually a fellow uh, commissioner. Uh, New Jersey just passed legislation to require that schools teach LGBTQ history as part of their curriculum. How do you see that being structured? Would you have any recommendations? Uh, do you know, it, it, the similar things in New York City, they're developing um, curriculum. Do you know, I, I, not to be like a crank, but I think the, mo the thing is really to teach it as a civil rights story. Do you know, I think that's the most important thing because that, that really gives it its justice in realizing that it was that there were people to realize that there was oppression right and to realize that the, our society changed because of political activism so, and I, so i think that really focusing on it as a civil rights story is and that's what i've done in all my curatorial work is the most important thing and that i think that's the place to do it right because and also you don't with children you don't necessarily want to talk about issues about sexuality you know it, like i think depending on the age group right but talking about this as a political situation and that was addressed politically i think that's the thing you want uh children and young adults to understand uh thank you uh so can you speak to the tension between now um capitalized and the lesbians in now in an effort to get a ERA passed? That's from uh, Tim, TQQ. Oh, yeah, do you know, it's so um, I have, library is really one of the great places in um, this organization, the Lavender Menace. Um, and so Lavender Menace was this organization that, and, um, and story in the book, I'm blocking out her damn name. Uh, she, oh, Tales of the Lavender Menace. You edit the book, you forget the person's name. And I know her, <laughs> sorry, senility, I'm getting old at this point. But um, it's really documented in our collections and we have it in the book. And it's really in 69, 70, there was a tremendous, um, especially Betty Friedan, and was really trying to get all the lesbians out of now. And she had this thing about how there was a lavender menace that was threatening the women's movement. And was really, it's in some ways, it's kind of this politics of respectability that she really thought that lesbians would discredit the feminist movement. And so she was really trying to get all of the lesbians out of, out of now. Um, I don't think I'm exactly answering his question. I'm answering a different question, but that's my right. Um, but, uh, and it was this action, the Lavender Menace action where they crashed Now's conference in the, the winter after Stone was like 69, 70, and uh, with these t-shirts that said Lavender Menace um, and uh, crashed the whole thing. And really it was this turning point in the feminist movement to really the, um, really of lesbians being a, a mainstream part of the feminist movement um, in the 1970s. And they really changed that whole uh, discourse. So it's actually, it's funny, Ellen Broidy, we had her at the library earlier this week. And I, unfortunately she's never written anything, Ellen Broidy, but Ellen was one of the people with Craig Rodwell who planned the first Pride March. Um, and actually she helped plan the Lavender Menace action and all the t they had all these t-shirts, we have pictures of them that said Lavender Menace, but they were all dyed, they couldn't find purple t-shirts and they dyed them in Ellen Freud's bathtub. Um, so <laughs> it was that, that action. Yeah, but it, it and it's, it's part of this whole thing is, it, it wasn't easy, that relationship between lesbian activists and feminist activists, it was fraught in the 1970s. And I think it's still not, 
it's not uh, without uh, tensions. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've answered the question. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my questions is, um, like, as you were curating this book, did your understanding or feelings about LGBTQ history evolve or change? And if so, in what way? Do you know, for me, it was really realizing how far back um, transgender activism and political organizing goes, right? Like that was the piece that I didn't know as well. And like find, re reading Virginia Prince and reading about Reed Erickson, read the Mario Martino story, right? It was really just, and it, the library, we have lots of these kinds of magazines from the 1960s and 70s by transgender people. Um, uh, there's this other ones that tra the, it's great, which I, there's one of the limitations of the book is um, if for every piece I had to find a copyright holder. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are lots of things that just, I was like, I'm never going to figure out who owns the copyright to this thing or who like there's uh, this uh, zine, the voice of the transsexual action organization, the it was the voice of Tao and uh, it had things about aliens and uh, the occult and the right, real like count deep 1970s counterculture um, kind of stuff. And then for Mario Martino who started, his nurse and starting this self-help organization for Jim, Virginia Prince is doing activism. So there are all of these really compelling and interesting stories about transgender experience in the 1960s and 70s um, that I don't think people really know about. And it's really like we're thinking that it's this, I think so many of us think it's this thing that's happening now and really it has a much longer arc as a political community and, uh, and literature than I think people appreciate. That actually leads me into the last question I think I'll ask, which is, you know, we have all this movement now, as you indicated before, things are uh, coming up again in kind of like this cycle that seems to keep happening. Um, one, like what changes, if any, or differences do you see between the movements that sort of happened Stonewall and, you know, after between what what's happening now? And also as a librarian, how an archival, at an archival library, how are you curating that information? You know, I, I tend to, like, I sort of focus on this thing about relationship between the African-American civil rights movement and um, LGBT civil rights movements. And it's because I, I think it was so obvious to people. I think it's something that in, right now you see lots of people trying to make those connections and I think that they're overlooking that actually those connections were there from the start and I know that the LGBT if you read things by LGBT activists in the 1960s they were completely aware that that was their inspiration and their model was African-American civil rights movement. It was totally post Stonewall. They were looking at the Young Lords and the Black Panthers. And there was all these relationships between gay activists in the early 70s and uh, Young Lords, Black Panthers. So I, I sometimes I, in looking at contemporary things, it seems like people are looking for what's the connection and they're not seeing actually that was the that's that's how this all happened right and so that's why i like that's why I need to do an anthology like this is so people can read that and they can read ernest and Eckstein talking about how those things are connected right like a lot of, you hear now people talking about intersectionality as, as this concept but really intersectionality isn't a new thing that's actually what came out of the 1970s and it was even particularly african-american lesbian activists with groups like uh the salsa soul sisters which we i have in the book is that they were it's and it's audrey lord it's all of these figures they were trying to figure out how these different uh forms of oppression and political structures interrelate in their experiences as uh, people of color and as gays and lesbians or transgender people it was there in star that was what street transvestite action revolutionaries were really trying to figure out right so We've been thinking about this for a very long time. <laughs> so I think, it, and you have a lot of people idolizing uh, the people of that time, but not necessarily reading what they had to say. So I think mm. it's really good for us to, let's go back and reread those things from the 1970s because they were dealing with exactly these same questions that we're struggling with. Um, 
so on term of documenting it, like it is more complicated at this moment to document things partially because everything's shut down and it's been a major issue for us in our collecting so um we're going to start doing some oral we haven't announced this in a public way but um uh, we're planning to do cool. some um, oral history um, interviews and things around this time period um, that we're planning and hoping to launch soon. Um, and that's it, that's also part of why with the trans the New York City Trans Oral History Project is like there's parts that in our physical archive that we had, but I but we knew there was so much that was in people's heads that wasn't written down from this activism from the you know from 1960s on. So. Um, I think oral history is really important as a companion to physical print archives. So, um, so that that's been a focus right now, and I think it's going to be a focus for us uh, going into the documenting both this COVID crisis and um, this political activism that's been happening this summer. Is um, so we're investigating oral history, right? Because yeah, how do you capture these kinds of things? Uh, lots of other places are doing web archiving, which is also really important. Um, uh, and particularly it's the Ivy Leagues, this group Ivy Plus, that's a lot of the Ivy League universities are really focusing on um, our sure. websites. So um, yeah, it's a really a struggle of how we're all gonna capture this moment. The 2020 is just <laughs> 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 yeah. down at all levels. Yeah. Well, Jason, thank you so much for coming. I mean, I what I didn't say at the beginning was that after I read this book, I basically wrote this like really overflowing gushy letter and he didn't laugh at me. He just responded very generously and said that he would come and speak at the library. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Like, I'm so thank you for emailing me. I'm honored to be asked, you know, it's <laughs> great to, to have an opportunity to, so thank you for the opportunity to talk about the library and its collections. And, and, and when, when the library opens up, there's a lot more to explore um, in these collections. So definitely visit the NYPL. Yeah, and online, our digital collections, all of those pictures by Kay Luzen and Diana Davies are actually freely available on our website, as is the, trans, uh, the New York City Trans Oral History. It's all 200 interviews are available for free um, to listen and read from home. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jason. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>